to be in the Lord's house today as I am. Are you? I don't think so. You got an extra hour of sleep this morning. You ought to be charged up and ready to go. Some of y'all are going, yeah, right. I've been awake since 3 o'clock this morning. We're glad you're here today. We're glad that you're in the Lord's house. We're glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us today. And I'm so excited about today because I believe the Lord's just trying to do a work in some folks. And I believe he wants to do a work here today. And I hope that we're willing to allow him to do that today. So this morning as we come, let's just give him all the praise and all the glory because he is a great God. Every day he is a great God. We forget that sometimes, I do believe. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you so much for being just that great and awesome God. Lord, we thank you for the grace and the mercy that you bestowed upon us all week this week, Father. Lord, as we come this morning, Lord, we just want to give you what's yours, Father. We want to give you all the praise and honor, Father. And Lord, I pray that everything that's done here today is for your praise and honor. Lord, as we come this morning, Father, we lift all of those on our prayer list up this morning, Father. Lord, the ones that are hurting, the ones that are sick, Lord, the ones that's lost loved ones, Father. Lord, we pray, God, you just do a work in their life, Father, Lord, but we just pray you will be done. Lord, this morning as we come, Lord, we ask for a fresh anointing from the Holy Throne this morning, Lord. I ask you to anoint the, the singing this morning, anoint the word as it's preached this morning, Father. And I, again, I pray you get all the glory. We love you this morning and we thank you this morning, Lord. This name's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 260 in the church. Thank you. 
One of them Holy Spirit moments, ain't it? I reckon it is.
Spirit won't do a work here today. It's all according to if we're going to let it. You know, we hard-headed rascals sometimes. Some of us even sit there and go, that, no, that even me, that don't pertain to me. It does pertain to you too. You know, I'm telling you, as we come to church, as we come this morning, I had this passage of scripture in my heart all week and was anxious to see what the Lord was going to do with it and uh, I believe he's going to do a work with it this morning. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. And I want to show you something out of the very first part of this this morning. A, a scripture you've heard a thousand times. 
You've heard it preached a thousand times. You've heard it taught in Sunday school a thousand times. There's songs written about it, songs written with it in it, and we understand a little bit about what it means. But, you know, we'll never understand everything what God means in his scripture until we get on up to that place in there all the time with him. Then we won't care as long as we're in the presence of Jesus, okay? But in this passage of scripture, I want to show you some things this morning. You know, I'm just glad this morning. You ever just, be, you ever just got up glad? I mean, just absolutely got up with gladness in your heart. I'm glad. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to hear this, and I wouldn't embarrass this young man for nothing in the world. I'm glad Kevin Wyndham is sitting on that road. Why? Because Kendall was in an accident Thursday morning that could have very well and very easily taken his life. But God had a plan. His grace was so evident. His mercy was there. His hand of protection was so strong because he had a plan. So that makes me glad this morning. I'm glad that you're here this morning, each and every one of you. Even if you came begrudgingly, I'm glad you're here this morning. And you look at me and you say, Preacher, what are you talking about? Did you know a lot of people get up and go to church begrudgingly on a Sunday morning? They get up and say, there's a lot of other things I could be doing today, a lot of other places I could be doing today, but i got to go to church. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't got to go. I get to go. I get to be in the Lord's house this morning. I get to spend time with the Savior this morning. I get these things in my life, and I hope you get something this morning that can help you just a little bit, okay? In this passage of Scripture, we see Jesus speaking his parables, and I love, when Jesus, I love to study the parables and find the meanings of them. And, and understand what a parable is. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's something that Jesus shared when he was here, but he was sharing it to the fact that he wanted to teach something out of it. And even as he spoke in those days, and he taught the disciples, and he taught the, the people that would listen something out of those stories, we read them today, and he's still teaching us fresh and new out of those stories he told so many years ago. Isn't that great? That's why they call this the living word. That's why Jesus is a living Savior, because he's still alive today, and his word still rings true today. So in this passage, in this 15th chapter of Luke this morning, look at this. And we've read it a thousand times. Some of you know it by heart. It says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, what a man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that one which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That passage of scripture right there, we understand what the meaning of it, and we, we've heard it preached and we've heard it taught. That's one of the most powerful passages of scripture that there is. When you read that parable and you start to understand a little bit about it, because I'm going to tell you something, we know what he's talking about right there. We know if you've ever raised animals, if you've ever farmed, that if you lose an animal, you'll spend hours sometimes searching for that one animal, and you want to make sure that one animal is safe before you go back to the house. You want to make sure you'll do everything, you'll exhaust every effort you can to make sure that animal is safe. One night, this is a couple years ago now, I guess, we heard some racket over in where the goats were, and had a donkey over there. We heard racket over there. It sounded bad, you know, so I go, I'm going to see a Bible. Well, Brenna goes with me. I think I've shared this with you before. <coughs> Brenna goes with me, and we get in the pasture, and we're searching around, and I've got a flashlight, and she's behind me, <laughs> taking every step I take, getting out of the flashlight. Well, I seen old Geraldine coming across through that old donkey, so I cut the light off. I said, I've got to cut this light off a minute just to see if we can find what's going on. <laughs> So I cut the light off, and about the time I cut it back on, old Geraldine nudged her in the back. 
And she almost, she said she didn't, but I believe she wet her britches. I ain't sure. <laughs> but she screamed and hollered, and then there all the goats run up there. But we got all the goats counted and checked out. She was my goat helper years ago. She, she jumped right straddling goats with me. But we got them all counted. We got them all checked out made sure they was all safe. <laughs> Geraldine got a good laugh, and we went on. As God searches out for lost people, as the Holy Spirit searches the heart of people, can I tell you what he does? He goes after that one that's lost. Can I tell you something? You were that one that was lost one day. And that day, listen to me, that day that God saved you, that Holy Spirit had intentions for you that day and you only. We're the ones sitting beside you. And I'm not saying he couldn't save anybody else that day because we've seen him move in multiple lives. But it was specific that day. He had intentions that day. And as Jesus began to share this, we see who was there. He called out all the publicans and sinners. You're going to find Jesus, listen to me, you're going to find Jesus with the imperfect people. You're going to find Jesus in the midst of the imperfect people. You also had the Pharisees and Sadducees there. And I'm telling you something, there's still Pharisees and Sadducees in the church today. There are still Pharisees in the church today. The ones in the church that says, I do no wrong. The ones in the church that says, I have no sin. The ones in the church that's afraid to say, I've made a mistake. They take that pharisaical view towards things and say, listen, I don't need a Savior. I got myself. I don't mess up. And you say, preacher, that's pretty harsh. But it's true. I'm telling you, it's true today. But you know where they find me? They find me with the publicans and the sinners up there. That's where I'm at. That's where I'll always be because as long as I'm in this fleshly body, I'll have sin in my life, okay? And this, this parable begins to teach us something. Jesus is always in the midst of sinners. But listen, to reach the lost, we ourselves have to be in the midst of sinners. I'm telling you something. You're not going to see anybody saved if you spend all your time in the months. Now, I love spending time with God's children, and I love spending time with the old saints of God. But listen to me. You'll never see anybody saved if we spend all our time sewed up in the saints of God and not trying to reach the lost that's out there in the world. we got to go to where they are. Just like that shepherd that will leave the just behind to go where the lost are to share the gospel. Jim said it best a while ago. Tell me the story of Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I love to preach. I love to share with you. I love to teach. I love everything about God's word. And I love sharing the story of Jesus with you. But I love it when he puts lost people in my way that I can share the story of Jesus with. I love that. Do you love that today? Does the church love that today? we got to reach the lost. Luke chapter 14, one, one back, says that when you go in, he sent a servant into the highways and the hedges to do what? Compel all to come into the marriage over there, to the supper over there. We have to go out into the highways, into the hedges, and we got to compel the ones to come in through the power of the Holy Spirit to where this God is that we serve. I love this God we serve. And I'm going to spend my time working for him. And as you look at that passage and you think about these things, you think about Jesus sharing these words, we know that we have this whole thought process of the lost in mind. We know what the scripture says right there. Now, absolutely, heaven rejoices over one that comes to repentance. But can I tell you something? I saw a little bit different things in this this week, and I want to share something with you this morning. And I want to share three simple things with you today. He also goes after the ones that slip away. He also goes to the ones that slip away, the ones that know Christ, the ones that have been saved, the ones that know who they are in him, but they tend to go a little bit in a far direction. You know, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus says that wide and broad are the ways to destruction. It, and then what it says over there, that wide and broad, wide is the way and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. Have you ever noticed that in God's house and in God's children, we want to go as wide as we can? We want to stretch the limits of what God has. We want to get to that brink and say, I'm going to stretch this limit of what God has. I'm going to stretch this limit of where God is. I want to go just as far as I can the other way away from God without stepping all the way out. And we want to justify that. We want to justify walking in that wide road. You ever got in, a, in the turning lane on 285 over there and knowing you've got to get out of that lane but can't? And then you stay in that lane, next thing you know, you're on the streets, you don't know where you are, and everything in Atlanta is a one-way street. 
You're going down one-way streets and one-way streets and one-way streets trying to find your way in a direction, and you can't find it till you stop and ask somebody, and, and I don't mean this ugly, but when now when you stop at a store to ask, they don't speak English. <laughs> and you can't find direction. You see what happens when we get on that wide road, we live, we live it on the brink. Next thing you know, we're steered away. Yeah, I heard about some ladies driving in circles yesterday. <laughs> and I'm going to leave that one alone. I'm going to save that one for another time. But see, the wider the road gets, the more dangerous it gets. But we want to walk all the way on the outside. We want to walk on the brink. Because Jesus also says in that same passage, that straight and narrow is the, right, is the way to go. It's the best way to go. That's where that straight old adage is, the straight and narrow. Yeah, I'm walking straight and narrow now. You ever heard somebody say that? Jesus says straight and narrow is the gate that leads to me. And you know, when you think about that and you look at that, God searches for all of his children. He wants to bring all his children back into his place. But you know one thing that absolutely, listen to me, one thing that I get asked over and over and over, and I always have the answer, and I'll be quick to tell you I don't. Preacher, I've been searching God's will out for my life, and I just can't find it. I've been searching for it, and I just can't find it. You know why we can't find God's will most of the time? Because we complicate it so that we don't want to find God's will. I'm going to give you three things this morning that, that I saw in this. And I thought about how God searches and how that God comes where we are and how God comes to where the lost is. <coughs> There's three simple steps this morning. It's three simple things in God's will that we need to understand today, okay? And if you'll understand these three, listen to me. If you'll understand these three, God will take care of the rest of them. First thing I want you to see this morning, it's God's will that you be saved. It is God's will that you be saved. John 3, 16 explains that as plain as day. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is God's will that every man in this world and woman and child in this world be saved. Now we know they won't because some people refuse to give in to God's will. That is the first thing you need to understand. That's God's will for every life is that person to be saved. And I'm telling you something, if you're a born-again child of God and you're saved, you've made that first step into God's will. You've understanding what God has for you. He's got salvation for me. And I'm telling you, God's people need to learn how to rejoice in their salvation. They need to learn how to be excited about their salvation. When's the last time you were excited about being saved? I mean, excited about being a saved person. Excited knowing the fact that if you left this world today, you're not going to bust the gate and hell wide open. Excited to know that if you're a saved person and God has shed his grace on you, he's laid that mercy out on you, and you've accepted that, that he has a plan for your life and he wants to work in your life. He's right there with you every step you take. It's the rejoices of salvation that we miss too many times today because we take the thought process of this, and this is what the world views salvation as. If you become saved, you become a child of God. That means that limits you as the good time you can have in this world. It limits you at the things you can enjoy in this world. I'm going to tell you something. I can enjoy more things today than I've ever enjoyed in my life. And you know what? I can get up the next morning and feel good about what I've enjoyed. I can feel good about what God's done in my life. I can feel good that I had a Savior that loved me enough to save me. I can feel good about that. So that's the first thing in God's will you've got to understand. He wants every man to be saved. Sadly, not everybody's going to accept, accept it. Second thing, listen to this. Now, listen to me. When we get all three of these facts right, then God, will work, then God can be evident working in our lives. Second thing I want you to see this morning. After salvation, that you would give him the worship and praise that is his. That's his will. That's what he wants. That's why you were created. To give him worship and praise him. Our problem is we don't want to do that. We're afraid to do that. Somebody's going to call me crazy if I, if I give him my worship and I give him my praise. Did you know everything that in your life you have is because of him? Everything he's done in your life is because of him. 
And the Bible teaches us without him, you are nothing. Now, if I'm, without, I'm nothing without him, why should in the world would I not want to give him my praise? Why would I not want to say, okay, God, work in my life and I'm giving you my praise. But listen to me. Praise and worship is a funny thing. Praise and worship is a funny thing. Because here's what we want to do. We want to give him, oh, we'll hold our hands high. We'll be excited about what God's doing when we're up on the mountain in that mountain of experience. And God's doing such great things in our life. Oh, look at my praise. But the praise God wants is that all the time praise. Even when it's your lowest point in your life. Even when everything's not going right. Even when everything is crashing around you, you give God the praise. He's still God. You say, that ain't easy, preacher. I didn't say it was easy. But if we'll understand our salvation, give God the praise in the good times and in the bad times, then God will work in our life. Because you know what? Psalm 22, 22 3 tells us that God inhabits the praise. It says, Oh God, thou holy one, he inhabits the praise of Israel. And if he inhabits the praise of Israel, which is God's chosen nation, he inhabits the praise of his holy nation that we've come to know him in Christ. So therefore, he inhabits the praise of the church today, even in the bad times, even when things ain't going exactly right. You ever had a time when things just weren't going exactly right and you had one of these? You ever had one of them weeks? One of them weeks. We were laughing a little bit this morning, Kenneth. I think Mr. Charles and Joe thought the rapture done hit Thursday morning. Because when they called me and told me that Kenneth had had an accident, I was trying to get Robin out of bed. He couldn't answer his phone. And I was up here on my tractor. We were unloading some hay across the road over here. And I was on the tractor. I called back to the farm told Matt to bring me my truck so we could go see what was going on. We just left tractor with flashers and everything on so when Charles was going to get some more hay, when he got back, tractor and flashers were still there. Randy was gone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all goodness gracious. Raptor don't come up in here and I missed it. <laughs> you see, what happens is sometimes we miss the things of God. We miss the things of God. That's what God does because we're not paying attention. See, he inhabits the praise of his people. And if we got our salvation that, he, that can only come through Jesus Christ, there ain't no other way to be saved. Through the shed blood of Christ, through accepting what he done across the count. And we get our praise and our worship where it should be, good times and bad times. It's kind of like a marriage. You know the marriage vows in sickness and in health? We praise him in sickness. We praise him in health. He's still God. See, when we get those two things right, when those two things are where they should be, the third thing's going to come. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll begin to serve Him gladly. It's God's will that not only we be saved, it's God's will not only that we give Him the praise and worship, but it's His will that we serve Him. That serving gladly is hard for us. Because we think that word service is work. And it is work. Ain't no doubt about it. But when we serve him gladly, it's amazing what he'll do in our life. Psalm 100 verse 2 says this. Serve the Lord with gladness. I love that 100 song. Serve the Lord with gladness. And if our salvation is where it should be, listen, there's only one way to be saved. But you, there's different ways to enjoy your salvation. If, our, if we're in our salvation where we need to be, our praise and worship is where we need to be. We'll serve him glad. We won't bat an eyeball. God says do it, we do it. God says go, we go. We serve him gladly. God loves a cheerful giver. We know what that means. Not only should you give in your pocketbook, but also too you should give of your time and you should give of the talents and the things that God's allowed you to have. God has, listen to me, God has allowed this church to have so much when it comes to talent and when it comes to people. I'm not talking about just in the church and the church service. I'm talking about in the whole aspect of the way everything goes. He's allowed us so much that we miss half of what God has for us. We miss it, but he's allowed us to have it, so we have to use it. We have to use it and serve him gladly. 
Here's what we need to do, though. We need, we need to get that Isaiah syndrome. Send me. I'm ready. Don't ask no questions. Don't say, God, where? Just say, send me, Lord. Oh, we'd be like Paul. Not chapter of Acts when Paul came to know Christ. What did Paul say? What would thou have me do? What would thou have me do? But instead, here's what we do. Y'all read the book of Jonah? We want to be old Jonah. I'll run as hard as I can, as far as I can. I'll escape this thing. I'll get on a boat. I'll head to a place that I'm not supposed to go. I'll escape this thing. Next thing you know, you're laid up in the belly of a fish with God dealing with you, and you can't go nowhere until you say, okay, Lord, I will. See, if we'll just come to service in him gladly when he calls us and tells us what to do, let me tell you what happened then. We come back into that place because here's what he does. He takes his children. Not only does he search them out so they can be saved, he searches them out so that they can do his will. These are the three basic things of God's will right here. And if we get these things right, guess what? He'll take care of the rest of it. He'll take care of the rest of it. And can I tell you something? You sit here this morning and you say, my, wide, my road has gotten so wide that I just don't understand. I know, I know God's searching for me. I can feel it. But when we let these three right here get out of whack, when we let these three things in our life, in our, in our life in Christ, get kind of out of direction, you know what happens? Everything else falls apart. Everything else falls apart. Why? Because when we're right here, this is the center of our attention, and we're giving God everything, and we're giving him everything in us, and he keeps us straight. He keeps us headed in a direction. But as soon as we take our eyes off of these things, have you ever noticed this? Listen to this. And I'm going to use just, not, just the church in general as an example. Have you ever noticed this? When someone stops serving, that means, man, they, 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 were, they were excited and they were working. But all of a sudden, when they stop serving, you stop seeing them as much. And then when you stop seeing them as much, things in their life start to just go crazy. Just get out of whack. I wonder why that is. Because when you stop, you step right outside of God's will. You step outside of what God's will has for you. And he has ways of bringing you back in there. In this passage, Tell you something. As, as a pastor, I get so excited when I see somebody say, but I'm going to be honest with you. That feeling lasts for a short time, and this is wrong with me. That feeling lasts for a short time, and then all of a sudden, we're not as excited about it the next day. And then the next day, we're not excited about it. And then the next day, we kind of even almost sometimes forgot about it. We're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of that. But as excited as I am, when I see God save a soul, I'm also excited when I see God deal with his children and then be obedient enough to let God bring them back to where they know they should have never left. Sometimes he has ways of doing that. Sometimes he puts us in positions to do that. God's will is to protect us, not to hurt us. God will absolutely never put you anywhere that his will can protect you. His grace is all over. But what happens is we step away. We move away. We gotta stop that, church. When Jesus laid this, this passage out, when he laid this down right here. He said, my father will lay aside everything to find the ones that are falling short. He will. Can I tell you something? You're sitting here this morning, and I'm sitting here this morning, and I understand that many areas in my life I go astray. Did you know we have just a bleeding heart? Listen to me when I say this. We have a bleeding heart for stray animals, right? We can't stand to see a stray animal. 
about straight here. About straight church members. And they, they're like it. I'm telling you. But our heart don't bleed for them like it does an animal, does it? Our heart don't get broken for that. We wonder why our lives end up in a mess. And I'm not telling you that if you're walking right in these parameters right here that you're going to have a perfect life. Because you're not. But I'll tell you one thing. You'll have a better life. You'll have a better life. We wonder why we just can't seem to get things under control. Because we kind of push things out of control. I'll never forget one time, years ago, me and a friend of mine been working on an old truck I had. And we had that thing run for years. We did. That thing was running good. But we didn't know that we had pinched the brake down. So we bail off this old hill over there. And guess what? That truck was out of control. It had no brakes. And there wasn't anything to stop it except the bottom of that hill. I could see it coming. And I knew this was going to hurt. But there was no way to stop that hill. It was spiraling and out of control. And the bottom was the only thing. You may be here today. He'll either stop it from spiraling or he'll wait for you at the dock. And when he waits for you, and when he waits for you at the bottom, you know what he's going to do? He's going to bring you down. That's what my God does. And I believe this morning God will leave those 99 just to go to that one. Whether it be that one that's lost in the sin. Needs to, come, needs to come to Jesus this morning? Where does it be that one that's life's just kind of spiraling out of control right now? You realize in those three things of God's will, you've stepped completely out of it. And ever since, your life's just become embarrassing. God's searching for you this morning. He wants you back in that fold. You might be here this morning. You, you, you're thinking about all family members. You haven't prayed for it. Why? Think about some praise that you had given in a while. It's not too late. As long as you got air, as long as you're breathing, it's never too late to come back to where we're right now. <coughs> Here's the thing: if you're hearing that voice this morning, he's calling. He said, "Come to me. Come to where I am." Maybe he's speaking directly to you. But he can't do a thing until you say, Here I am. Lord, I hear you. I hear you. So this morning, as they come with a song, 177, church members. You know if, if God's speaking to you today. Ask him, God, oh God, bring me back in the fold this morning. As you stand with us this morning, as they begin to sing this morning, when God begins to speak to hearts and lives this morning, be obedient to God today as they sing. Please. 
some praying men right there that will come and pray. Be obedient to him today. Be obedient. 